Welcome back to the Couple Studios. I'm Jesse Freeston, and right off the bat here, we're gonna get at something that a lot of people have been asking me about, which is, what is decouple? What does this word mean? Well, the word decouple refers to decoupling or ungluing material human well-being, represented by my right hand, and ecological impacts on my left hand. So. Up till now, for the most part, human history, these two have been going side by side as time goes by. And what we're trying to do, or what the goal of a decoupling would be, would be to continue uh, improving human material well-being on this planet while not having the ecological impacts. An example of this might be something like a region seeing material poverty be eliminated while at the same time having carbon emissions go down. That would be a real successful decoupling. But it's not just carbon emissions, we're talking about mining, we're talking about pollution, we're talking about land use, we're talking about all the ways that humans impact the environment. Personally, I've been through many waves of crippling anxiety in my life, just thinking about the future livability of this planet. And the idea of decoupling has really been the only sustained place where I've found hope for the future of the people here on Earth. And one of the many minds that's been helping me along this path has been John Simons, author of Eco Modernism. I had the pleasure of meeting up with John in person recently where he described this fascinating difference between the two movements that most impacted him in his political upbringing. Well, on the one hand, he had the green movement, the environmental movement. On the other, he had the gay rights movement. And specifically how those two movements saw the role of technology in helping them overcome the major global threats of their time, whether it be climate change or HIV AIDS. Many of the environmental activists that I've worked with would say, we have the technologies that we need to address climate change. Talking about innovation is simply advocating for denial. We just need to adjust our lifestyles so that we stop emitting carbon, and that's all that's needed. Whereas the legacy of ACT UP, the political response to the HIV pandemic. This month, the total number of Americans killed by AIDS will top the number of Americans killed in Vietnam. And the negligent homophobic attitude of the Reagan administration. White House officials confirm that the president has never talked with his Surgeon General about AIDS or read the report Dr. Koop sent him last October. As far as his administration was concerned, the correct approach was to, and this is their slogan, teach restraint as virtue. Mr. Reagan said prevention is better than a cure. I think that abstinence has been lacking in much of the education. The gay community, alongside inventing things such as safe sex practices, also demanded that the state should invest in medical research. While the theme of this parade has always been gay liberation and gay pride, the emphasis this year was an appeal for funding to help stop the spread of the AIDS disease. Medical research that ultimately would deliver drugs that would either prevent people from contracting HIV and also prevent the illness from spreading so that people can now live many, many decades an entirely normal life if they're getting proper treatment today. Now, the voices in my ear from the Green Movement said that that wasn't the way in which we should be talking about climate change. The answer was to go back to a radically simpler way of living. I too, at different times in my life, have been kind of seduced by this idea of a society-wide return to simplicity. I still believe that many of us could benefit from reducing our consumption, both spiritually and also to give a little bit of relief to this planet. But recently I realized that there's something pretty dark about hoping for a civilizational collapse just to force us all to go find our callings as happy subsistence farmers. I mean, that option to walk away and take up that simple life is kind of available to a lot of us as individuals if we wanted to take it. But it seems to be that some of us are waiting around for daddy apocalypse to punish us for our sins and rip those screens out of our hands and force us to go back. Whether or not we might be happy without smartphones and social media, um, that may well be true. But the simple reality is that there are now 8 billion people on the planet. And we provide for the needs of those 8 billion people with a technologically complex system of producing food and other goods. If we go back to the simple technologies of the past, that simply isn't possible. Fertilizers are produced using gas 
and that around 40% of global grain production would be lost were we to stop using fertilizers. How do we make fertilizers without fossil fuels? We know we could do it, but there is innovation required in order to head in that direction. There are some things where behaviour changes may well be necessary. Public transport is always going to be more efficient than a car-based society. But there are many elements of our lives that are difficult to decarbonise. At the moment, we do not have a zero carbon alternative to aviation. Sure, you might say we don't need to travel so much. We can live good lives without going on holidays. But there are many people who are now separated by vast distances from their loved ones, from their families. There are many people for whom a pilgrimage, the Hajj, or studying overseas for a semester, um, seeing their grandmother on the other side of the world. These are things that are quite significant in people's lives. So if we say teach restraint is virtue, um, you know, that, that we should address climate change by denying people all these experiences, well, it's quite likely that that's going to be a less um, attractive, uh, less politically viable way of responding to climate change than if we were to develop a zero carbon alternative to long distance aviation. Another one, rice. Methane from rice is somewhere in the vicinity of responsible for about 2% of warming gases. Some languages like Cantonese are asking, have you had lunch? You're asking, have you had rice? Do you want to tell people for whom rice is the bedrock of their cuisine that they need to simply transition away from rice? Or do you want to find a way to produce rice that is not emissions intensive? They would probably involve new rice varieties, whether it uses gene engineering or other breeding processes is a highly technologically complex business. Genetically modified organisms, gene editing, I mean just saying these terms kind of still gives me the squirms a little bit to be honest. For those of us who are in a position to easily acquire organic food, it might not seem like there's big consequences to opposing something like GMOs, but for a lot of people on this planet, having crops that are more resistant to things like drought or floods or pests or that simply produce more food on less land, well, that's a huge plus and every day more so as climates change. I'll probably never fully shake that fear I have that something terrible is going to happen as a result of genetic engineering. But that icky feeling I get when I think about the thousands of people in white lab coats in rooms with no windows or plants playing God with tiny little innocent grains of rice. I hope we can agree that that discomfort that, that produces in us is not really to be weighed against something like hunger for somebody else. Or as in John's example of telling people they can't have rice anymore or, in the case of AIDS, telling people to stop having sex. In New York City, a Republican campaign proposal to close all businesses that cater mainly to homosexual men. It is our duty to protect these people from themselves. The AIDS virus has no civil rights. Now, it's not just that ACT UP's response to HIV was better than the Republicans' response. It was also the only one that was going to work. We can organize our politics around urging people to change their behaviors. And I urge everyone who will listen to me to stop eating meat. And so far, I've persuaded about no one. Um, but certainly, if we produce um, uh, plant-based proteins or uh, engineered animal proteins that don't involve the animal cruelty but taste just as good as meat, well I find it a lot easier to persuade people to eat those uh, meat substitutes that let them maintain their traditional eating practices. When you got AIDS, did it make you think again about being gay? No, I have absolutely no regrets. When the Republicans said, teach restraint is virtue, ACT UP said, no, why would we give up sex? In the same way, if the climate movement says, why would people give up eating rice? Why would they give up visiting their grandmothers? That is not some kind of betrayal of politics. That is a social movement recognizing the material desires, the material needs of ordinary people and crafting a politics that speaks to those needs. And if you have a vision of a good world where the average person does get to travel every now and then, does get to have a wash their clothes in a washing machine rather than the physical drudgery of going down to a river, well then we need not just to kind of clean up our current 
systems of production. We need to be finding ways to increase the material welfare of people the world over. This focus on global material inequality is another thing that really draws me to decoupling. It's environmentalism that doesn't leave anybody behind. In this video we're doing right now, for example, we're celebrating the efforts of activists and scientists in rendering a horrible global pandemic not nearly as deadly and dangerous as it was when it started. But in the last year, 400,000 people in Sub-Saharan Africa still died from AIDS. Imagine a world though where absolutely everybody who wants it has access to these life-saving medications along with clean drinking water, washing machines, transportation, maybe even on a high-speed rail. And now you're getting into that vision of decouple, that long-term love over fear worldview. And speaking of that choice between love and fear, I wasn't actually around for the worst of the AIDS epidemic here in North America, but after spending quite a few hours going through the news archives of that time, I have to say I was quite shocked to see exactly how extreme that fear-based judgment got. 50% of Americans favor quarantine for AIDS victims. 48% said they should be issued special identification. 15% said AIDS victims should be tattooed. So the American writer Susan Sontag said that plagues are invariably understood as a judgment on the society that they afflict. And our first response is normally a conservative one, of wanting to shut down, to go back to simpler ways of doing things. I'd argue that the climate movement needs to draw on all the available tools, including arguing for public investments in low carbon innovation as a way to move from that conservative, judgmental position to a more open, optimistic response, finding better ways to live together. That does it for this episode of Decouple Studios. Thanks for checking in. While you're here, why not do a little liking and subscribing? so you can catch more of these when they come out. And if you want to go deeper on the ideas of John Simons, there's an episode with him over at the Decouple Podcast. Go check it out.